Gresham College presents Thinking Theologically About Modern Art, Part 2 Modern Art, The Art of Modern Life by Professor George Patterson So it's a very great pleasure to welcome as our next speaker, George Patterson, who uh, is the Lady Margaret Professor of Divinity in the University of Oxford. Um, George is um, one of the few theologians who's, who's really seriously engaged with um, contemporary art and in a variety of media, including film and literature, as well as the visual arts. Um, you'll, uh, many of you will know some of his works. Art, Modernity and Faith uh, is one of the pioneering books, it seems to me, in terms of this the sort of conversation that we're having today. Uh, and more recently, Crucifixions and Resurrections of the Image. So there's no one better, really, to, to uh, hear from on a day like this, and I'm delighted to hand over to you, George. Thanks. So my title is Modern Art, the Art of Modern Life. Modern Art. But what is modern art? Whatever it is, one thing is for sure, that its history has been marked by a succession of attempts to define it. Since these attempts have often been proposed in such a way as to promote one kind of art or exclude some other from the canon of modern art, these have mostly been violently contested and none has ever taken entire possession of the field. Indeed, defining the field and what really counts as modern art is precisely the issue of such debates and amongst art critics and scholars this is debated with great passion, polemical force and knowledge which always scares off people like me. So I shall not go into these controversies, but shall rather attempt to illustrate one particular view of modern art, an exceptionally influential one as it happens, by referring and il illustrating the view from a range of artists and their works that might reasonably be cl classified as modern, and then to think about how this might help us reflect theologically about modern art. The view in question is suggested by Charles Baudelaire in his essay, The Painter of Modern Life, a eulogy of the now largely forgotten painter Constantin Guise. Baudelaire does not claim Guise for modern art on the basis of any formal principle, but simply on the basis of his being a painter of modern, i.e. contemporary, life. Uh, and this is uh, one of Guise's works. Whilst the public at large, says Baudelaire, are largely inclined to think of art as more or less identical with the great works of Titian and Raphael collected in the Louvre, or perhaps even what he calls the charming and coloured engravings of the last century, quote, these artists portray the past. Now it is the painting to the painting of contemporary manners that I wish to pay attention. The past, as he goes on to say, is interesting by virtue of its being the past, but, he continues, the same thing is true of the present. The pleasure we derive from the portrayal of the present uh, comes not only from the beauty in which it may be clothed, but also from its essential quality of being present. This, then, is Guy's service to art, that he's an unashamed painter of the present, an artist enraptured by the life of the modern urban crowd. And like Edgar Allan Poe's Man of the Crowd, quote, joyfully breathes in all the germs and emanations of life under the spell of a fatal, irresistible curiosity. In an authoritative and influential study, T.J. Clarke transposed Baudelaire's phrase to Manet and his followers more generally making it a definitive feature of the breakthrough to modernity that occurred in mid-19th century Paris. And of course, Manet and subsequent Impressionists were also very much painters of modern life, like Guise, painting the sights and evoking the sounds of modern life, from pleasure parks, to railways, to horse racing, and on to war, insurrection, and executions. In this perspective, modern art is simply doing what art has always done. As Baudelaire says, every painter of the past had his own modernity, a point he illustrates by reference to how portraiture is always of its age, 
even down to the gesture, the glance, and the smile that is unique to each period. Modernity is, in this sense, a trans-historical constant, albeit of a paradoxical kind. It is, as Baudelaire writes, the transitory, the fugitive, the contingent, the half of art, of which the other half is the eternal and the immutable. But we may take issue with Baudelaire at this point and suggest that what we're accustomed to call modernity actually relates these two elements, the transient and the eternal, in a way that's very different from the art of previous ages. What is characteristic or characteristically modern in this regard is precisely the exclusive attention to and absorption in the present in what is transitory, fugitive, and contingent. This is why Manet and the Impressionists remain quintessentially modern, and the pre-Raphaelites do not, even though one might argue that there are aspects of their draftsmanship, use of technical resources, and compos composition that are very distinctively of 19th century industrial England. Of course, by using portraiture to make his point, Baudelaire was cutting a few corners, since this is the main genre in which the artistic concern to represent the present in its, as it were, presentness, reaches back way beyond modernity to the medieval world and beyond. Yet since classical times, and until the last several centuries, the presentness of the present has only been incidental to the majority of forms of artistic representation. Religious artists of the later Middle Ages could incorporate touching scenes of contemporary rural life into nativity scenes, and by the time of Bruegel, these could be rendered almost as if they were present events. Bruegel famously takes an interest in contemporary life for its own sake to a new level, even in pictures as metaphysically charged as Hunters in the Snow which I personally regard as the greatest painting in the Western tradition, which is partly why I've just used an excuse to show it. <laughs> as Hegel already commented, 17th century Dutch painting of everyday life marked a new threshold in the Protestant liberation from the hieratic uh, and the classical. And perhaps in Baudelarian terms, this is the first truly modern art, the art that is content to be in and of its time in every day contemporary life. Seeing modern art as the art of modern life in these terms is probably too all-inclusive for the purposes of art critics with their invariably polemical agendas. But it does give us a thread to follow links through many of the otherwise very diverse forms of modern art. The theologian Paul Tillich, like many of his German contemporaries, including Thomas Mann, disparaged Impressionism for its typically French fascination for the glittering surface of metropolitan life. Unlike the German expressionists, they said, who looked beneath the surface to the dark, ambiguous depths. But whatever their differences, impressionists and expressionists, French and German, are both painting modern life. Yet modern life, modern art, is not what one would see simply in a photo album in which were collected all possible images of modern life between 1862 and 2012, for example. But the representation of all there is to see in these images, including what lies beneath the skin, what can only reveal itself from angles and points of view that are inaccessible to straightforward mimetic reproduction, and that mirror the new complexity, one is tempted to say the hyper-complexity, of modern urban life in which the self is continually barraged by reflected images of itself in shop windows, photography, the ubiquity of advertising, and for that matter, the ubiquity of art. In such ways, the modern world inaugurates what has been called a new kind of observer, which we experience every day just walking down the street. You don't have to go into an art gallery uh, to experience it. And of course, modern life in this sense is not limited 
to the superficial kaleidoscope of color, line, and incident that Baudelaire saw in the contemporary crowd. As pioneered in the Crimean and American civil wars, photography, film, and painting would make images of war as essentially defining of the self-understanding of modernity as images of Parisian boulevards and parks and coffee tables. And uh, that's uh, from Otto Dix's uh, triptych, a, a deliberate uh, e evocation of a medieval altarpiece of which this is the central painting. And of course also war's aftermath in revolution, in grief, and the maimed bodies of veterans, revelatory also of the unhealed scars inflicted on Europe's soul. The Second World War would add its own images of modern life, whether heroic, unendurable, or surpassing human understanding. Of course, we in this country still spend billions of pounds uh, having enough of these things to destroy a third of the world's population for some reason. Returning to the city, the 20th century saw urban styles very different from those engaged by Baudelaire, Gies, and Manet, and for that matter, by Kirchner and the German Expressionists. Edward Hopper is supremely the painter-poet of post-war urban anomie. And just for a change, consider the great contemporary British artist, Rose Wiley, whose work is also, in its own wonderful way, the painting of modern life, just for once, British life. At this point, however, you might want to object that I am, after all, making modern art sound too much like a simple visual chronicle of modern times. Surely what's most characteristic of modern art, and precisely why it so often provokes violent reactions, is that it doesn't look much like what the viewer supposes it's meant to represent. Or perhaps it doesn't really look like anything, and maybe it isn't intended to be like anything. For some critics, at least, the complete annihilation of external content was the ultimate goal of a truly modern art, the reduction of painting to the two-dimensional picture surface, pure painting, liberated at last from the tyranny of representation. But surely this isn't the painting of modern life. A similar question might be raised by currents in so-called postmodern or conceptual art. Even if the individual pieces of Damien Hirst's Last Supper are, in some sense, representations of the labels on pharmaceutical products, it's hard to say what, if anything, the whole ensemble is meant to be a picture of. And of course, sculptural works such as those of Anish Kippur, previously mentioned, are so far from seeking to represent anything that they seem to be aimed primarily at combining a sheer delight in the technical possibilities of the materials with a whimsical transformation of our own self-experience. And I could go on and on. But I suggest even in such examples, there's a sense in which we are dealing with an art of modern life. For such works illustrate, in a very loose sense of the word, distinctive features of modern life itself. Features we might sum up as the quest for autonomy, conceptualization, and the reconfiguration of experience through technology. None of these are uncontested sites of the modern world. Nothing in modernity is uncontested, but they are nevertheless strong themes running through modern life in various of its dimensions, intellectual, moral, political, and religious. The titles of many of Mondrian's severely geometrical abstractions already alert us to what we might call the homomorphism, the similarity of form between such paintings and the urban landscapes of New York and all the 20th and 21st century cities built ever more vertiginously in the image of Manhattan's skyscraper skyline. Perhaps it's no coincidence that it was precisely in North America that abstract expressionism was to find its most fertile environment, as in the Chicago abstract expressionist Robert Natkin. 
In such works, whether we assign them to modern or postmodern art, we are called to witness the renunciation of the eternal and the immutable in the favor of the way we live now. If this is so, then we can perhaps begin to see why modern art has been so problematic for Christianity, and why it's had considerable theological invective, sometimes officially sanctioned, heaped upon it. In general terms, this may be simply because a great many religionists don't get on well with modern life. Certainly, the culture of autonomy, abstraction and conceptualization, and technocratic production has proved a culture that is at many points in tension or at odds with the cultural values of ecclesiastical Christianity. And this conflict isn't mitigated by the fact that many artists have nevertheless individually affirmed their commitment to spiritual values or religious practice, as did Cezanne, or deployed Christian theological resources in their painting of modern life, thus Stanley Spencer. So I want to move on to a slightly more theoretical level now and consider this challenge with regard to the question of autonomy, where I think it is particularly clear. Autonomy is one of the salient features of modern thought, adduced by Kant, again, as a defining principle of the Enlightenment. In his essay, What is Enlightenment? The German philosopher famously wrote that Enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-imposed immaturity. Immaturity is the inability to use one's understanding without guidance from another. You can already see why clergy would start to feel uncomfortable with this. <laughs> this immaturity is self-imposed when its cause lies not in lack of understanding, but in lack of resolve and courage to use it without guidance from another. Sapere aude, dare to know. Have courage to use your own understanding. That's the motto of enlightenment. Nothing is required for this enlightenment, however, except freedom. As a philosopher, Kant was especially concerned with the free use of reason in the pursuit of knowledge. But as his essay goes on to make clear, it has important implications when we come to matters of social order and the powers of temporal and spiritual powers to prescribe the limits within which freedom is allowed to operate. Yet Kant was undoubtedly aware that we are not our own makers and that there are limits, albeit not yet fully known, to what we can do and know and hope, strictly on the basis of our own reasoning powers. Such reserve would not be acknowledged by many subsequent modernist thinkers. And via Dostoevsky's nihilists, the end of the 19th century would see programmatic declarations of the omnipotence of human beings to create their own values and realities. Nietzsche was, of course, the intellectual spokesman of such self-creating supermen. But his view, vision of the absolutization of will to power as the foundation of human being was eagerly taken up by a generation of radical artists, including expressionists and futurists. And there was undoubtedly even a dash of Nietzscheanism in aspects of the Bolshevik Revolution, even if the Bolsheviks necessarily spurned Nietzsche's artistic individualism. His self-portrait by Otto Dix, representing himself as Mars in the helmet of the German Imperial Army, quintessentially captures this particular early 20th century brand of Nietzscheanism. But there was a lot of it around in England as well as in Germany, I should add. We've gone rapidly, perhaps too rapidly, to extreme examples. And modern life testifies to manifold and many more modern, modest versions of autonomy that affect the way we live at many levels. Think, for example, of the aspirations of nation states to independence from foreign rule or to speak their own language, the struggle to maintain national or regional traditions. Think of the modern world's pragmatism its focus on the job in hand, suspending moral or other factors deemed extraneous to the job, whatever that may be. This then is the context in which abstract art's pursuit of the pure abstract form 
is so far from being abstracted from the general current of modern life as itself to represent one of its defining features, but doing so, of course, in a form proper to visual art. Yet autonomy is also a site of intense contestation, not least in relation to both theology and art. At the very beginnings of modern theology, uh, often associated with the German theologian Friedrich Schleiermacher, the view that human beings could attain to complete autonomous self-mastery was opposed by the theological view that we cannot make any sense at all of human life unless we understand it as infinitely and absolutely dependent on God. A similar message would be propounded by Kierkegaard. And if Dostoevsky put in the mouth of the nihilist Kirillov the view that man had to assert his self-will to free himself from God, he did so only to show the emptiness, despair, and ultimate self-destructiveness of the would-be Superman. In the word of another Dostoevsky character, such radical autonomy is the modern world's rebellion. In relation to art, Jacques Maritain would eloquently condemn the Renaissance for surrendering the blessed humility and communal values of what he regarded as the matchless epoch of the Middle Ages, and doing so in favor of an individualism that would ulti ultimately prevent man from remembering God. We can therefore see a number of ways in which modern art, precisely by being modern, being the art of a culture striving for maximal autonomy, might challenge a religious view of life, and do so in such a way that our response to it calls in question as to how we're to understand our own way of being religious. Against the Nietzschean heroism of the generation of 1914, a Catholic artist such as Rouault would set the suffering Christ of his own Catholic devotion. A later self-portrait by Otto Dix, entitled Ecce Homo II, from the end of the Civil War, showing himself as a defeated prisoner of war, also illustrates from another angle the failure of the more absolutist versions of autonomy. Unfortunately, but perhaps uh, tellingly, I couldn't find that particular painting uh, on, on the web. This is a work from a Stations of the Cross by Dix from 1960, entitled Echo Homo. Further to its pursuit of autonomy, the modern world is also marked by a hitherto unequaled tendency to conceptualization, most obvious in the achievements of modern science. But conceptualization and theory, necessary as they are for the practice of science, have also been extended far beyond their proper domains. This becomes especially problematic when it's the human being, him or herself, who is seen reductively in the mirror of such conceptualization. Not least controversially, Marxism in particular, though not solely, has followed Hegel in believing it to be possible to theorize the history of human freedom and to develop a scientific view of human history. This needn't rule out all possible input from that mysterious thing called human freedom, yet it would seem to limit in advance the sphere within which freedom can be operative. Hegel himself regarded freedom and concept as virtually synonymous, but few since have shared his confidence that the concept and conceptualization adequately express all of that to which human freedom aspires. Contemporary Darwinism, however, seems to be doing its best to revive the Hegelian Marxist paradigm without the commitment to social justice. Again, it's unsurprising that this is a highly contested aspect of the culture of modernity. Again, we might look to Dostoevsky, who saw Peter the Great's artificially created city of St. Petersburg as, as he put it, the world's most theoretical city, and as such, the enactment of an ideological program that sought to create a nation according to a certain, as it were, pre-programmed idea of what a modern nation ought to be, rather than allowing it to evolve and develop. Peter wanted Russia to become a Western nation, so he built a Western city in a highly inhospitable and inappropriate environment. For Dostoevsky, this was also to create the kind of context 
in which the forgetfulness of God, typical of those who sought only their own absolute autonomy, could especially flourish. Since then, of course, many other nations, cities, and neighborhoods have been created. I should have a whole string of illustrations here. Sorry, I don't. Sometimes more, but often less successfully, as projects in the cause of some form of civic or social engineering. But even if successful, how well do such projects serve the interests of corporeal, incarnate human beings? The question is raised, in, in, in a sense, um, you know, think back to, to Ben's talk for the points and connections I, I'm making here. <laughs> Happily, I'm able, though, without prior planning, to, to presuppose them at, at this point. The question's raised very forcefully in the poetry of the Orcadian poet Edwin Muir, of whom I'm a great admirer. Muir sees Calvinism's reduction of religious life to theology as anticipating a crisis endemic to modern European humanity. The fleshless word growing will bring us down, he warns in the poem, The Incarnate One, predicting the advent of an abstract calamity, save for those who can build their cold empire on the abstract man. For Muir, Dostoevsky and other critics of modernity, but also equally if oppositely for modernity's own advocates, the conceptual, conceptualization of life isn't just about theory in the sense of pure theory. It's also critically a means to the transformation and reconstruction of human experience itself. Lenin's dictum that communism is electrification plus the Soviets sums up much more than his own political program. Pure science is only rarely pure, as the culture of research funding makes clear. This is not to say that it's not virtuous, simply that it's military, engineering, pharmaceutical, psychological, or other applications are only ever provisionally out of the picture, suspended, but never absent. So too, modern art is in many of its works not about representing the experience of others, but engendering new possibilities of experience for the viewer. Indeed, shaking the viewer out of the purely contemplative pose into one of active engagement. Walter Benjamin famously spoke of how modern art has lost the aura of uniqueness in an age of mechanical reproduction. Why go to Paris to see such and such a work by Manet when I can buy a perfectly good quality reproduction? Well, that's in London, of course, not, not Paris, but uh, for us provincials, why go up to London to see it when I can just go down to the uh, art shop and buy, buy a book? Yet we do continue to go to Paris and London, or, and we flood to the blockbuster exhibitions that bring Paris or Milan or Moscow to our hometown. We want to see it for ourselves, to taste it with the tongue of the eye, as Robert Natkin used to say, to have the experience. Seeing itself becomes experience. Art becomes a technically smart means of making us see things we wouldn't otherwise see left to ourselves, as true of a painting by Manet or Monet as of an installation by Olafur Eliasson. Here's some people wandering around in a fog in one of his installations. An amazing experience, if you can have it. I, I recommend it. Whether the focus is theory or experience, though, we cannot escape Baudelaire's observation that what we're dealing with here is a matter of the transitory, the fugitive, the contingent, and not the eternal and the immutable. Edwin Muir's first book, a collection of prose essays written under the influence of Nietzsche, was entitled We Moderns. And the arguments between autonomy and heteronomy, between conceptualization and experience are arguments about how we, we moderns, are to be and to live our lives. They're not arguments about what is eternally and timelessly true, but about what's required from us in our historical time and place. Even the most heavily conceptualized views of human life encountered in the modern world are therefore always edged with a certain pragmatism and action directedness. The question is not, who are we, in a sort of philosophical, timeless way, but how are we to be? Or to go back to Lenin again, what is to be done? A genuinely modern 
is therefore not simply absorbed in the ephemeral detail of modern life, it also involves a renunciation of any attempt to represent the timeless and the eternal. Such attempts may recur within the modern period as defined by historians in the form of various kinds of classicism and a certain kind of romanticism, but they are, I suggest, essentially alien to the modern world's realization of its own temporal finitude and relativity. Hitler's project of a thousand-year Reich would have been laughable if it hadn't been for the way in which he attempted to realize it. But even this insane vision stopped short of imagining it could found an eternal city, an essentially pre-modern dream, perhaps last attempted uh, by Ivan the Terrible. And it was te tellingly overshadowed from the beginning by Wagnerian fantasies about its own downfall. They knew it couldn't last forever. It wasn't a new Rome, an eternal city, or a Jerusalem, a heavenly city. Most other social models have been hugely more modest in their ambition. Indeed, in our own society, we only go as far as the next election. In the modern world, we all know nothing is forever. Whatever else it may be, our art cannot be a vehicle of timeless, eternal truths. In this context, actually, it's interesting that this language of timeless, eternal truths of art survived much longer than it did in the Soviet Union than it did in the West, which is perhaps because of the way in which the, the Soviet ideology kind of bought into an end of history myth that they were indeed about setting up some permanent new order of, of social being. So where does this leave religion? If religion, as many of its adherents believe it to be, is the sphere of human beings concerned for timeless eternal truths for what cannot be reduced to the horizon of being in time, can an art that is genuinely modern also be religious? One way of addressing this question might be to reinterpret religion itself as a way of engaging transient temporal life, as in the later philosophy of Don Cupid and in aspects of popular Western Buddhism, the mindfulness movement. Yet it would seem that no matter how deeply incarnated, and perhaps especially when truly, madly, deeply incarnated, religion cannot help but retain a memory, or if you like, a hope, of its one-time recollection of the eternal. How might that memory be represented? I end with two images. The first is from classical Chinese painting, a form of art based essentially on the juxtaposition of images of time and eternity, of what is constant and what abides. This picture by the 18th century painter Shi Tao combines two of the great themes of classical Chinese landscape, mountains and water. The mountain evoking what is eternal and unchanging, the water what is transitory and fleeting, the world of human life. But as the Chinese painters understood, even the mountain, the image of the eternal, can in the end only be figured against an empty background. The picture is about the eternal, or about the interplay of time and eternity, but it necessarily renounces any attempt to represent the eternal. For a world that's become thoroughly modern, eternity, or the eternal, has become an empty symbol, capable of most of a certain emotional emphasis. Eternal love. You know, think of the song, An Eternal Flame, and people stand in the crowd and wave around their cigarette lighters. I mean, that's a wonderful kind of parodic uh, case of what eternity means for contemporary society. You know, the flame of a cigarette lighter is an eternal flame. It's probably why, when it seeks to be religious, modern art is often merely pathetic. Perhaps we therefore do better to seek a theology of modern art at the point at which art abstains from representing timeless, eternal truths. And by the quality of its engagement with the transient, fugitive reality of everyday life, hint at the unfigurable and in time empty horizon of the eternal. Thank you. Sorry, that's...
have some time now for questions and discussion, and uh, let me throw it open to you. Whilst you're thinking, I, George, can I, I, one phrase um, that uh, I find quite helpful um, is that uh, what Christians, including Christian artists, are engaged in is not um, a relation, is uh, not an unchanging relationship with God, but a relationship with an unchanging God. And it's that, that sense that in order to re relate to an unchanging God, one needs constantly to be changing oneself, that I think you know, permits some of this artistic engagement with the transient that you've been, been showing us. And that's just to, to agree with you. I don't know if you want to respond. Yes, and as a, I mentioned the beginning of modern theology, which is often associated with this theologian, Friedrich Schleiermacher, and in a very important text called Speeches on Religion from 1799, he described what he called the, the natal hour of everything living in religion, which, is, which he said was a very momentary, transitory experience in which we seem to be at one with the world, an experience he thought, I think, was chiefly given us in, in love, in the sort of everyday sense of the love of, of, of man and woman, that sort of moment of opening up to, to another person. But as he said, you know, the moment you think about it, the moment you even represent it, it's, got, it's gone already. And that, it, it, in a sense, that, that moment of fulfillment, that moment of, of being in touch with the eternal, is for us, as soon as we think about it or try to represent it in art, is always already gone, and we, we have only the trace of its having having been. And I, I think, you know, this, this for me, I mean, is why people like Manet and, and others are so great, is because they don't pretend to do more than that. And, and I think one sees in you know, things like Albert Speer's architecture for, for Hitler, the, the opposite of, the, the, of that, or Soviet architecture, or Disney World architecture, the, the, the attempt to create something, uh, there's a certain pomposity, if you like, an attempt to give permanence and status and weight and depth and, and grandeur to, to what is actually only passing and transient and ephemeral. Thank you very much. You um, dismissed the Pre-Raphaelites. Um, but um, many of them did, did paint um, things of the time, particularly James Collinson, whose paintings were always ordinary people doing ordinary mm. things under ordinary circumstances, ordinary conditions, that's immigration and emigration. Um, the painting you showed, of course, was of no period mm. at all. Um, but to dismiss the Pre-Raphaelites, I think, as non-modern art, I think it was probably a mistake. <laughs> Uh, I, think, I think I wouldn't want to dismiss them lock, stock and barrel. I mean, I was speaking about a particular, you know, their, their penchant, let, let's say, for certain kinds of r romantic, uh, nostalgic representations of a non-existent Arthurian and or Christian biblical past, which they went in for and which I, I see every, every day in the stained glass of Christchurch Cathedral, in, indeed, although I, I was actually thinking when I, when I put that bit in and... Uh, this is, this is very different from the representations of the poor that one gets of some of them. And G.F. Watts as well, I mean, also painted some scenes of, of uh, ev everyday life too, though that's not what we chiefly remember him uh, for, for now. But, uh, and some of you will know this, I, I, I expect uh, Lord Harris may remem remember this, that in the uh, stained glass window of the legends of St. Frideswy, the patron saint of Oxford by Edward Byrne Jones, um, the very final scene showing her on her deathbed, surrounded by Saxon holy, holy women in the background behind the curtain is a, depicted a modern flushing toilet, only just <laughs> invented a couple of years before the execution of the, of the work. So yes, in their own way too, they can't help being uh, painters of modern life. But yeah. No, I mean, I, I think generally it's... Um, you see, this is one of the reasons why I kind of find it very difficult to hang around too much with, with art critics and, and people who write about art because they are so polemical and they kind of say, well, pre-Raphaelites are no good or, or impressionists are no good, you know, or conceptual art's no good and, and, and they have fierce arguments as to why, you know, there isn't anything good in, in the work of a particular... But I, mean, I think most of us, you, you sort of take things as, as, as you find them and I, and I think any, any school or, or movement and... 
you know, if you just kind of wander into a local village hall where people have put on an art show of local talent. I mean, there's always something good. There's, there's some human quality, some, some human touch, I, I think, in even, no, not, 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 not in absolutely all, but, but, but in, in, in the vast majority of, of human enterprises that we call art, yes. George, you showed two pictures of Otto Dix, one of the triptych of the devastation of the First World War battlefield and the other uh, of a Stations of the Cross. You wanted to show a self-portrait, but you said it wasn't available. Did Otto Dix change his stance on life very radically between uh, sort of 1918-19 and that post-war period? Because it seemed to me there was a pretty fundamental difference, not just in actually the scene, uh, but in what I would could only term as a kind of responsiveness in that second de depiction. Um, I generally don't know. I'd be interested to, to know whether he did change his stance on life between those two paintings. I, I, but there may, may be other, other people here who, who could answer that better, but I mean, from my li limited knowledge, I mean, one sees this self-portrait in 1914, and like a lot of people in 1914, you know, war's great, we're going to kind of stamp our will on, on the European order, uh, you know, and it's buzzing with flashing lights and the, the imperial helmet is kind of painted Nietzscheanism of a, of, a, of a certain kind. But of course, even by the 20s, you know, he's painting these, these you know, he, he's, he's seen it all. Uh, and he's painting these terribly maimed bodies of, of the people who were his comrades and he's lived through the, the Western Front and like many, including Paul Tillich, for example, I mean, that actual experience of war completely transformed their, their attitude to it. And he certainly uh, was, of course, the Nazis regarded him as pretty decadent and he, he affected what many people regarded as a kind of Im inner emigration and, and went to live, I think, actually just outside Germany in, in, in Liechtenstein, perhaps, uh, and painted rural scenes in a more 16th century way and kind of got out of... Um, out of that world. So I, I think, yes, he had a, a, a sort of retreat from, if you like, the hubris of, of, of that. And there's this, <coughs> certainly in the pictures and this. Yes, anyway, this painting Echo Homo too, I, you know, I strongly recommend it. It shows this shattered body of a prisoner of war in, in 1945 that, um, you know, is the opposite end of the spectrum from self-portrait as Mars, really. And, and all the more powerful as the, the visual testimony of someone who had made that movement in, in their life as well. Thank you. That was very interesting. Um, I want to put something tangential. Um, what seems to me to be the constant of modern life now is constant change. You know, your mobile phone is out of date three months after you bought it. And what perhaps we need is not so much transcendence of a God and a human sacrifice in the nature of Christ of 2,000 years ago, but stillness, mm -hmm. to stop moving, to find the still point in the turning world, and make something much more akin to Taoism, and maybe that's what's needed rather than, yes, something like that. It'd be nice to know what the poem or whatever it is above that says. Rather than seeking it in the past which was meaningful 2,000 years ago. Well, well I agree <laughs> um, in, in, in many ways. I went to a talk a, a, a number of years ago by Anthony Gormley, which had the incredibly clever title, uh, Still Moving, um, which I, I think maybe captures both sides of that, because, of course, we can't simply opt out of moving and of being in motion. And even if we all renounce mobile phones and all their works uh, and just choose to sit still in some ancient monastery or some beautiful country spot we're all, as those of us over a certain age all knows, we're all moving through time, all subject to all manner of change constantly without our doing anything uh, uh, about it. So that, that there is a sort of constancy of motion but still moving, to be still 
in the moving. Interestingly, again, I don't really know enough about the, the, this to, to comment, but in the, the text where I came across this uh, painting, uh, said that Shi uh, Tao himself was regarded, interestingly, as a very revolutionary painter in his time. For us, this is, a, as it were, a, a sort of timeless image of Taoist worldview, and, and yet it, it, it too is of, of its time. And I think part of what Yes, part of what maybe I'm saying towards the end of, of, of the talk is that the way to find this stillness, the eternal, if you like, is precisely through our attention to what's changing in time. Uh, and perhaps I think very much in the spirit of some of the things Ben was saying in, in, in his talk too. Those people in the, was it the Museum of Modern Art sitting opposite that still figure that Ben spoke of in his previous mm. talk? It didn't need a cathedral mm. or, or nature. They sat in front of a human being who was still, and it had a profound effect on many of them. But I think this is part of the, the very iconoclasm was mentioned last time as part of the very positive aspect of iconoclasm. I mean, I think religion itself needs a strong iconoclastic current because, uh, and you know, even at a purely practical level, churches get cluttered. They get full of stuff, and Church of England churches in particular are full of all sorts of Victorian stuff. And thanks to English heritage and the Victorian society, you can't get rid of it. You know, and, and these become... You know, I mean, I, I would love, well, not the Burne Jones windows, actually, but most of the other Christchurch windows, I mean, I'd love to see them smashed, broken, taken out, and to let God's pure light uh, in to, to, to play on the wonderful stone. I, I mean, there's, uh, you know, the, we, we create environments in which it's very, very difficult to, to, be, to be still, to, to think, even too much visual stimulus, of, often a not very good kind. And I mean, just because something's representing Jesus doesn't mean it's good. Thank you. Um, as an aside, uh, a few weeks ago I had a um, talk which I found notable for not mentioning Schleiermacher and Kierkegaard, who I thought did need to be, so thank you for <laughs> bringing them. Um, in talking of change, um, change, profound change in individual artists, I'm thinking, say, for example, of Poulenc or Picasso or Munch, um, and you've mentioned some. Are there other uh, in, in changes that you would like, you could mention to us that far further the imagination? How, how do you mean? Do you mean the sort of thing we were talking about when we were talking about Dix's change from this sort of Nietzschean Superman to the... Behold the, behold the man, that, that, that kind of thing. Yes, yes, and change in, ch some, some, some say profound change in an artist's work or in the development of the work, whether it's been a national or an international or a personal uh, mm. revelation. And one of the artists I, I illustrated, Robert Natkin, um, uh, an abstract expressionist who died a couple of years ago, and throughout his, as it were, working life, uh, he had produced exclusively abstract works, but about uh, half a dozen years or so before he died, he started painting people uh, and, and the people he knew and liked, like his trainer at the gym and people like that, um, which was quite interesting. And that was at a time when there was also, I think, quite a lot of discussion about the return of figuration after it had been this, as it were, dreadful priesthood of art critics um, you know, who had said, you know, figurative representation, that, that won't do anymore. No one who's remotely credible as an artist is going to do anything like that or, you know, learn classical techniques of drawing or, or, or things like that. And, and, and yet people say, well, you know, maybe abstract painting is great, but maybe something else is great as well. And the human figure is, is also great. Though I think, yeah, this might threaten to take us too, too, too far afield, but... Um, the human, that, that doesn't mean necessarily returning to what, as it, as it were, quasi-photographic mimetic 
painting of, of the human figure because that's not actually how we see the human figure. We are beings in, in motion, again, and not just even if we're sitting here, here aging, but we move our hands, our head, our, our, our eyes all, all, all the time. We're active and we relate to each other in different ways, so that one time you're looking at someone and it's their face that you're seeing, or it's their hand, or their, their arm, or, or, or their foot. We relate to each other in, in, in multiple ways, so concern for the figure doesn't necessarily mean, as it were, simply going back to painting, you know, substitute photographs, as, 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 as it were. So that those kind of changes happen too, and the rediscovery of, of the body, or, and the, the rediscovery of, of simple genres sometimes as well. We're out of time, actually, and I, I want to just give you a chance to stand up and sort of move your body um, before the next talk begins and to give also Frances a chance to load up her images. So can I just thank, on your behalf, um, George Patton once again. For more information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.